All right, so good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me again. I was here a few weeks ago preaching in First Peter 2. But um, thanks for having me again. Um, so a little bit about me. For a short time at the beginning of this year, I worked at a coffee shop in Louisville called Starbucks. I don't know if y'all heard of it. Um, I was trained to make all these crazy kinds of drinks, everything from like a regular cup of black coffee, which is close to how I drink it. I just put a little bit of cream in it, so you'll know. So uh, from that to all these crazy like soy caramel mocha latte, all these kinds of crazy drinks that take like 30 minutes to make. They don't really take 30 minutes to make. But um, So another thing we had to learn was how to interact with customers, like taking orders, handing out drinks, and how to smile and interact with someone when they really did not appreciate the service that you gave them and really did not appreciate the drink that they ordered. And so one day, working there, I had this customer come in. We'll call him Brandon. Uh, Brandon came into the store, ordered a soy vanilla latte, extra hot, extra foam, with a cheese danish. We fulfilled his order exactly how it ordered. Like, I made it, I knew it was exactly right. Gave it to him, I said his name, and, well, I pronounced his name the way it was spelled on the cup, which it was spelled Brendan. And his name was Brandon. And so he was not happy at all about that. And he was also not happy about his drink because it wasn't what he ordered, which it was what he ordered. But instead, he actually wanted a Frappuccino, which is one of the cold drinks. So he just, he really let us know how he really did not appreciate that and how he was just experiencing just such a great deal of suffering in that time because we pronounced his name wrong and we made his drink wrong. And now, I, I don't know that we would necessarily call it the same kind of suffering, what I consider suffering, what he considers suffering. Because I would probably recommend a counselor or a therapist for what he is suffering through right now. But it was suffering nonetheless. And so, also, I didn't end up working there much longer than that. But anyways, the point of that story is to show us on our theme tonight, which our theme we're going to be focusing on is suffering. Uh, we're going to be going through one of Peter's letters, First uh, Peter chapter 4, 12 through 19. In this chapter, P Peter is writing to his fellow believers in a way to encourage them in their efforts. He is exhorting them in their work in hopes that they will be encouraged and will continue serving God in all of their circumstances. So in these verses, Peter is specifically addressing suffering. Ultimately, all suffering is a result of sin. Sin and suffering are interconnected, and you cannot have suffering without sin, and you cannot have sin without suffering. So if sin is there, suffering will be there too. And if suffering is there, sin has already played its part. And so no matter how much we want to blame someone else or something else, especially God for our suffering, we must remember that our suffering is a direct result of our sin and the sin of others. So before we jump into the passage, uh, there are three types, three general types of suffering that we experience. Um, the first one is that we suffer because of our own sinful actions. So our sin will lead us to suffering. We suffer because we are experiencing the consequences of our own sin. So whether it is the result of a small white lie, or because we have stolen something, or we have committed adultery, or because we have taken the life of another, or some other kind of sin, we will eventually have the consequences of those sin, and we will suffer because of that. The second type of suffering that we see is that we suffer because of the sinful actions of others. So now this is kind of the flip side of the first point. Uh, we suffer because of so the sin that someone else committed. Or another way to look at it is someone else is suffering because of our sin. Um, we see this a lot in like broken families and just all kinds of, just throughout the world we see this in everyday life. But uh, the third type of suffering, which is kind of the one that Paul is going to be mostly addressing, or Peter, sorry, is going to be mostly addressing in this, is that we suffer as a result of our faithfulness to Christ. And this is very similar to the second point, but it's because as Christians, we're going to suffer because of our faithfulness to God, because of what we do, the actions that we take that are in line with God's will. We are going to suffer for those. We are going to be persecuted at some point. Um, and so before we jump in, i got one more thing. Sorry. Uh, we have three application points I want to go over real quick. As we read through this, we'll see them come up. But the first one is, 
we are to anticipate suffering so that it can refine us. The second point, do not let your sin be the reason for your own suffering. And the third, let your suffering be a result of serving God. So real quick, we're going to jump into the passage in 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, verses 12 through 19. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will we be what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So in this first part, in the first part in uh, verses 12 through about 14, we see the first thing that I mentioned, that we are in to anticipate suffering so that it refines us. So in verse 12, we see that we are to do not be surprised when we experience suffering. Because suffering is a result of the sinfulness of humanity. However, Paul is specifically talking about the suffering that uh, comes from being a follower of Christ. When we follow after Christ and commit to his will for our lives, we will receive suffering and persecution for our faith. So let our suffering not catch us off guard and overwhelm us. Rather, embrace suffering so it does not take you off guard. So we must be able to prepare for suffering. We must realize that suffering is going to come so that when it does happen, we are ready for it so that it doesn't take us by surprise. And so when we prepare for and embrace suffering, we are also able to rejoice. We can realize that we are hitting the goal of being like our Savior. We can share in his sufferings and we can rejoice in it because that suffering is what is revealing his glory. And so in those situations, we can think, right, what, how would Jesus respond in this situation? How would Jesus respond to whatever suffering we're facing? And because we've thought about it, we can respond as best we can in the way that he would. So in moving down to about verse 14, so if we are insulted for proclaiming Jesus' name, you will be blessed because the spirit of God and of glory Spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. So let the insults of others be praiseworthy. Let their insults about your faith be honoring to God. And so like, how great of an honor is it to let someone else's insults be glory to God? And so like an example of this is we have an unbelieving neighbor who insults you for going to church or for praying or for making fun of your music tastes or anything of that nature. Those are praiseworthy to God because we are living in a way that God has called us to live. And so that when we live in that way, we can hopefully have the opportunity to share our faith, share our faith and share the gospel through that persecution and suffering. Um, so what Paul is trying to teach us here is to not be discouraged by these situations. So rather be encouraged in knowing that not only are you serving your creator, but you are doing it to the point that other people notice that you are different. So also knowing that your suffering is helping you to grow. We're going to jump over to 1 Peter 6 through 7. It's early in this uh, earlier in this chapter in this book. In verse 6 he says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor 
at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So even when we do suffer for the name of Christ, we know that it is a test of the genuineness of our faith. We know that its purpose is to help us grow and to, and to refine us so that we can become more faithful, so that we can become more like Jesus. So moving on to the second point, that I'm, do not let your sin be the reason for your own suffering. So in verse 15, we see this laid out perfectly. Oh, sorry, I was on the wrong page. So in verse 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer as a, or as a meddler. So do not allow your sin to be the reason that you suffer. We do not need to add additional suffering to our lives because there is already plenty of it. We need to get rid of the sin in our lives so that we can't, won't suffer from it, so that it won't eventually put us to death, because that is what sin will do to us. Our own sin will lead us to our own suffering. And when this happens, we have only ourselves to blame. So suffering and sin are directly tied to each other. We can't have suffering without sin. Our sin leads to suffering. That connection is so significant because we like to make other, ex we like to make other excuses for our sin. We like to justify our suffering by belittling our sin. And so, like an example of a person, he may ask these questions. Why am I suffering through this? Why am I facing all this backlash? Why am I actually going through literal trials like in a court right now? And why am I in prison? Why am I facing all this suffering and persecution? But this person committed a crime. This person murdered somebody or this person stole from somebody. So that's an extreme example. But... This also applies to the other little sins that we have in our lives that we may try to make excuses for, and then we question God as to why we're suffering. We're suffering as a consequence to our own sins. And so we must not suffer so we must not suffer as a murderer or as a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. But rather, let your suffering, this is the third point, let your suffering be a result of serving God. So in verse 16. If you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but glorify God's name through it. Let your suffering be a testament to Christ's suffering. Christ suffered as a result of the sin of man, not of sin from himself, for he never sinned. So let our suffering be like his. He suffered because he remained faithful and he remained true to the scriptures. So let, let our suffering be a result of our faithfulness to God. Let it be because we are living in accordance to his word and to the gospel. And moving down on to 17, we see judgment. We see the judgment that is coming for believers and unbelievers. We know that the outcome of believers on the day of judgment, we know what that outcome is for believers when judgment comes. We know that believers, as believers, we go to heaven. We experience glory in him. But what about those who are unbelievers? In that situation, we are called to share our faith. We are called to live as close to the word as we can so that when we are facing persecution, when we are facing suffering, that joy and that hope that we have can be the testimony to the people who are persecuting us and so that they will see that we are different and that we are not fighting fire with fire. And so that eventually, hopefully, they can come to know the Lord as well. In a verse, uh, moving down a little bit, in verse 19, Therefore, let those who will suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to the faithful Creator while continuing to do good. So when we suffer, when we face these persecutions, we must be able to entrust God in remembering that we have hope in Him, remember that we have salvation and glory in Him, and so that through this we continue to be, continue to do good, we can continue to worship him. We can continue to glorify him through our thoughts and our actions and all that we do. So when we face trials, we need to embrace these sufferings as Jesus would. When we are persecuted for our faith, and even when we are experiencing suffering like death or illness or cancer, we must let these trials prove the genuineness of our faith. We must let these trials and these experience experiences prove our faith and so that they can grow us and so that we can best minister to others. And so growing up, I'm from Georgia, whoever, um, 
from Georgia, and I grew up kind of in a broken home. Uh, it was me and my mom for most of my life. My dad and I have a good relationship now. Just It was hard starting off. But um, so one of the most important people in my life growing up was my grandmother. She was easily the second most person, most important person in my life. It was my mom and my grandmother. She was always there whenever I needed anything, whenever I had questions, or when, whenever I needed help with anything. And so for the longest time, she, like, after school, I would usually go hang out with her. Like, even when I was 16 and had a car, I would still go out there. But, um, so in the early 2000s, she suffered from breast cancer. Um, they were able to handle that at the time, and she was in remission. And she had no signs of cancer. And it was about four or five years ago, around Thanksgiving, that, uh, we found out that the cancer had re-metastasized into her liver. And it was really aggressive. Um, and we found it kind of late. And so she was originally diagnosed with about six months to live. And uh, in the span of about a week around Thanksgiving, it went from six months to she's got about two to four weeks and till she maybe had a couple days left. And so for me finding out, I think it was like Monday or Tuesday, all the way around, it was, I think it was Sunday that she died. Uh, it was very sudden. None of us expected it. She was, I think, late 50s or early 60s at the time. But, um, so, she was one of the most important people in my life. And so this was definitely, at the time, definitely the hardest time I had experienced in my life. But, um, and so one of the significant things about this moment is that, of my family, I'm one of the few that goes to church. I'm one of the few that uh, is a follower of Christ. And so during this time, I was actually standing in the hospital at this point, and I was talking to one of my youth leaders on the phone. Um, he told me the importance of this time and that I had with my family at this point. And not pushing aside the importance of grief and grieving in this moment, but remembering the purpose of life, remembering why we're here. And also remembering the importance of sharing the gospel. Because in times like these, people are looking for hope. People are looking for something besides death. What's next? What do we have after this? And so I did my best in the circumstances to stay strong in my faith and to share the goodness of Christ. And I don't mean to say this to like make me sound like a super Christian or anything like that. I'm far from that. Believe me, I'm far from it. But while we are here on earth, we will experience suffering. We will experience cancer, death, illness, all of these things. Suffering can be cruel and evil, but we will face it. We will face suffering regardless of who is responsible for it. Because su suffering and sin are tied together. And as long as we are here on earth, we will experience suffering because there will always be sin on earth. And so if we suffer, it's because of sin. And if we sin, it will lead to suffering. John Piper said this, All human suffering, especially the suffering of the Son of God, is meant to portray to dull souls the unimaginable moral ugliness of sin and the unimaginable offensiveness of sin to God. That's why there is suffering in the world, according to Romans 8.12. God subjected the creation to futility, not because it wanted to be subjected, but because of him who subjected it and hope for that new day. So God brought down calamities galore and diseases galore and death everywhere in order to make plain sin is ugly. So the purpose of our sin or the purpose of our suffering is to show us how ugly sin is. It is crucial that we see the true evil of sin and how it rips us apart and how it kills us. The most important thing to realize about our sin and about suffering is not, is not only that we will all face suffering, but we all sin. Every single one of us sins. For all, for it says in Romans, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And because of that, because of our sin, because of our falling short of his glory, we all deserve death. And if it ended right there, we would all receive death. That's exactly what we would receive if the story ended there. But because of Jesus, because of the life that he led free of sin, and because of the suffering that he faced, because of the death that he died, 
because of his resurrection, we can have freedom in him. We can have freedom from sin. We have freedom from suffering if we confess with our mouths and believe with our hearts that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. We have that promise that one day we will be free of this sin and the suffering that so entangles us here on earth. We have that promise. We have What we have here is not the end. It is only the beginning of eternity. My fiance Katie and I, we were talking about this last night. We were going through this a little bit. And she, she put it this way. She had heard this saying, But uh, unbelievers, this life right now is the best that we'll ever get. But for believers, the life on earth right now is the worst that we'll ever get for, for all of eternity. For believers, it only gets better because one day we will be free from the clutches of sin. We will be free from suffering. For non believers, this is the closest that they will ever be to heaven. For believers, this is the closest we will ever be to hell. So we must remember that in our daily lives. We must remember that when we are dealing with these people who are persecuting us. We must remember that in our suffering. The significance of why we need to share the gospel. Why we need to be strong in our faith. Because until we reach eternity, we must remain faithful where we are. We must anticipate suffering so that it may refine us. We must fight off sin so that it is not the cause for our suffering. We must let the suffering that we face be a testimony to God's goodness because it is only through him and the sacrifice that Jesus made that we can ever dream of being free from sin and free from suffering. So as we leave here today, as we leave here now, make it a goal right now to prepare yourself for suffering to be ready for when it comes so that when it does come we may not be surprised but we may be prepared so that we can let it strengthen our faith so we can let it be an opportunity for us to share the gospel so do this in a way that you can best honor and glorify god in your suffering regardless of where that suffering comes from so let that be our challenge as we leave here today let me pray to close this out Dear Lord God, I thank you, Father, for your truth and your word, God, for all that you have given us, Lord, for showing us the significance of our sin and the significance of suffering, God, and God, the role that they play in our lives right now, Father. I pray that you would help us just to all remember to be ready for suffering because we will face it, and especially we will face it if we are living in your word. And God, I just pray that you would help us as we go from here, God. I lift up all of us here today, Father, that you would help guide us in your word and guide us through our suffering. And Father, I lift up all the prayer requests that we have today, God. I just pray that you would be with all those situations. Lord, be with the people that are involved. And Father, help. I would pray that your name would be shown through all those situations. And Lord, let's pray all this right now in your holy and precious name.